All right, perfect. We are now live. So hello, everyone. My name is Rochelle. I'm the dietitian for Choices at Kitsilano. Before we get started, I'm just going to start off with some housekeeping. So for those who have attended this presentation, you are eligible for a nutrition buck. So what a nutrition buck is, is $10 off of Choices when you spend $50 or more. So a survey link will be sent out to you at the end of the seminar so we can collect your mailing address and all nutrition bucks will be sent out a approximately one month after the event. So you can visit or call your local choices store to talk nutrition with one of our nutrition consultants um, or myself at Kitsilano. And, or you can email us at nutrition at choicesmarkets.com. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can please enter them in the chat box so they could be answered throughout and at the very end of the seminar. So please remember that you'll need to sign into your YouTube account or create one if you don't have one in order to participate in the chat box on this video. Perfect. All right. So with that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce Jess Piernak. Jess is a registered dietitian, certified wellness coach, and gut health nerd based in Vancouver. She runs a nutrition consulting practice with a focus on gut health, celiac disease, and plant-based diets. Jess is passionate about education, prevention, and creating a healthy community. So you will find her with consulting, writing, and speaking on a variety of topics. Currently, she is in-house dietitian advisor for the Canadian Celiac Association of BC. So yeah, she's doing lots, has lots of experience in so many different things. So I am now going to hand it over to Jess. Thank you. It's funny. I actually didn't know what bio you had. So a lot of that I was actually going to repeat anyway. So perfect. I'm going to just share my screen right off the bat to make sure that we are ready to go. Perfect. Um, and just can you confirm for me that you can see that? I just want to make sure that you are good. Maybe just pop in and say yes to that. Okay. Um, beautiful. So Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for spending a random Thursday night with me. Um, it's kind of a gloomy Thursday, but uh, I was kind of hoping with the sun on Monday and Tuesday that it was going to be a really nice rest of the week, but I don't think we're going to get the, the sun anymore. So anyways, long story short, thank you so much for spending your evening with me. Um, we are going to be talking about celiac disease as well as wheat allergies, as well as non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and just regular being gluten-free as well if you don't fall into any of those diagnoses or labels. Um, I would love to tell you that I am amazing at multitasking and I can jump back and forth between presenting and looking at the chat box. Um, I am terrible at multitasking. So what I'm gonna try to do is to strategically stop talking at places, check in with you guys to make sure that there is no questions, um, but I'm definitely going to leave lots of room at the end for questions. So um, there is going to be plenty of time and I really, really want you to ask questions. So presentation is about you um, and I want to make sure that you get all your questions answered. So I can talk forever about anything, um, but I really want to make sure that this is, this is about you and you get everything that you need out of this presentation. So with that being said, um, maybe I should give you one more caveat with my slides. So when I was an intern, I spent a couple of months at the Ministry of Health. And while I was there, they got us to do this, you know, how to do a PowerPoint slide workshop. And basically the number one rule with PowerPoint slides is you don't want text on the slides. So you're going to notice that my slides are pretty, but they're not as helpful as you might be expecting. I am more than happy to share my slides with you if you do want them. So if you do, uh, definitely share your email address with me. I'm going to be giving you my email address at the very end of it. So copy it down, send me an email. I'm more than happy to share my slides with you, but I just wanted to warn you, they're not the most friendly, but they're, but they're definitely pretty. So, okay, let's get going. So before we officially begin, I would love to know who's in the audience. So I'd love to hear if you have been recently diagnosed with celiac disease, if you have celiac disease, if you're following a gluten-free diet because you just feel better being gluten-free, if you've been diagnosed with a wheat allergy, or if you've been diagnosed with 
non-celiac gluten sensitivity or non-celiac wheat sensitivity. So I'm just going to pause for a second and I'm going to give you a chance to put that in the chat box. Um, and I would love to see who's in there. So I will stop talking for a second. And if you don't know what you are either, by all means, if you just want to ask a burning question or you want to make sure that I address something in this presentation, then put that in the chat box now too, and I'll make sure I add it to our list. Okay, so daughter diagnosed with celiac disease. Um, thank you, awesome. Okay, I'll wait like 30 more seconds. Okay, and then while you're figuring out the chat box and putting that in there for me too, um, I, I will just tell you a little bit about my story with celiac. Um, so celiac disease runs in my family and my mom has celiac disease. So it was one of those things where I was a newly graduated dietitian and my mom was just fighting with the system, trying to figure out what to do and who to talk to. And she was getting some pretty conflicting advice. So it was one of those things where I kind of fell into it, just trying to help my mom out and my family members out because once one person got diagnosed, um, more and more people ended up having a positive diagnosis. So um, yeah, so that was kind of my journey into celiac disease. And then I ended up working with the Canadian Celiac Association as their RD advisor. And right now I sit on this really amazing um, RD working group for the National Celiac Association where we really talk about um, like new stuff going on and I'm gonna share a bunch of stuff with you guys because I think it's really interesting. So um, yeah, okay, so we have somebody else with celiac disease um, and someone does not know if they have celiac, but they wanted to learn about it. Okay, so it's a lot of celiac talk today, which is really helpful, thank you, because I do wanna make sure we talk about that and then I won't maybe spend as much time on the other gluten-related disorders. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for sharing who's out there. That really does help me. So today what we're gonna talk about is being gluten-free, what you need to change in your kitchen, what you need to know before grocery shopping, and some things that you need to think about. So in particular, a lot of nutrients that you need to be aware of, um, and then just how serious this has to be, because I think we get a little bit confused with the gluten-free fad that's out there versus people who truly feel ill and sick and, and have intestinal damage with eating gluten. Um, the gluten-free trend, it's pretty amazing how quickly it grew. Um, I remember like maybe 10 years ago, um, the gluten-free EXO, EXO was at the Italian Culture Center um, on Broadway. And then literally the next year, it was at the convention center and it was so popular that we were waiting in line for like hours and we didn't even get in because they oversold their tickets. And the year after that, it was at the B&E Exhibition Center. So it's grown and now it's kind of pulling back a little bit. So um, people who were following it because they thought it was a healthier diet, I think are not following it as much anymore. And I remember too, my brother-in-law, at the peak of when gluten-free was thought as a really healthy diet. I remember my brother-in-law, we were at a coffee shop and uh, there was like a basket of cookies at the checkout counter. And he's like grabbing three of them and he's like, oh, they're gluten free. I can have like three. And I was like, I don't think it works that way. But uh, yeah, no, it's definitely, I think the people who are curious about gluten-free lifestyle um, are following it because they have to, not because um, they need, they, they want to, I guess is probably the better way of saying it. 
So before we really get into some celiac specific recommendations, um, I do want to spend some time looking at this really boring slide about the difference between celiac disease, wheat allergy, and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. That's the MCGS. Sometimes it's non-celiac wheat sensitivity. I mostly see gluten sensitivity, but it, you could see it in both situations. So somebody with celiac disease is diagnosed with an autoimmune disease where gluten physically damages their small intestine. So that damage leads to inflammation and that inflammation leads to malabsorption. And with malabsorption, we see iron deficiency anemia, we see osteopenia, we see diagnoses of other autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's, we get malnutrition. So it's literally structural damage where these like small little microvilli in the in small intestine get destroyed. With a wheat allergy, so what's really interesting about a wheat allergy, it's what is happening, it's the IgE mediated, or it could be IgE non-mediated. So IgE is just the protein. So when you kind of get an allergy test done, and sometimes if you go see like a naturopath and get this huge panel of allergy tests done, they're looking at this like IgE. Um, also, non-IgE mediated would be things like it doesn't show up as a protein, but you would have symptoms like skin issues, GI tract issues, respiratory tract issues. So that's sort of where the wheat allergy comes from. Um, the, the response after having wheat or gluten could be, you know, two hours later, it could be 48 hours later, and it could be as severe as like an anaphylactic shock, which is where somebody would be, would stop breathing. So that's sort of the wheat allergy. Um, if you kind of go through this funnel and they say you don't have celiac disease, you don't have a wheat allergy, therefore you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So that's sort of how the diagnoses work. Um, what I want to talk about with this slide, I don't know if you can see it, I'm hoping you can, but, and if you want a copy of, of this particular slide or maybe where I even got this from, also send me an email and I'll send that to you because I think this is a very important slide if you're trying to figure out which category you fall into. So let's say the first thing you want to do if you notice that you have GI symptoms um, relating to eating gluten, I would always ask your doctor for the TTG test. So the TTG is an antibody test where they basically, you go into Life Labs, get your blood test done, and they look at um, if there's any antibodies in your system. The thing that's really important with this slide, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but a lot of times um, people have something called an IgA deficiency. So if you have an IgA deficiency and they don't actually rule that out, you could test negative for celiac, but it's really the IgA deficiency. So you always, 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 when you're ruling out celiac disease, want to ask for the TTG and the IgA. So once that happens, um, and let's say, let's say the mystery continues, right? So let's say you're not IgA deficient, you, your TTG comes back totally negative, then we're going to go and rule out the weed allergy. So what they're going to do is probably do a skin test, which is the IgE mediated response. Um, or you can just do, if it's a non-mediated IgE response, then you're going to just do an elimination diet and see if you feel any better. So I'm gonna stop there for a second to make sure you feel comfortable with the difference between celiac disease, wheat allergy, and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So just please, and if you have any questions about the diagnosis and how you go about that, um, let me know too, but I'm just gonna pause for a second. And while you're thinking of any questions or making sure you're on the same page with me, I wrote down with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, um, one to 13% of the population falls under this. And 36% of people who have um, irritable bowel syndrome, so IBS, also fall into this category. So 
I, it's kind of like IBS. So to, not to diverge too much, but to get a diagnosis of IBS, they literally do the same thing where they go, okay, you don't have celiac disease. You don't have Crohn's disease. You don't have colitis. You don't have diverticulosis. We don't know what's wrong with you. You have IBS. So it's kind of the same with this where they go, you don't have celiac disease. You don't have a wheat allergy. I guess you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So it's a really frustrating diagnosis. Um, but it's very common. So I just wanted to make sure if you do fall under that category, then you're not alone. Um, from a avoidance perspective, and this is kind of where we're getting into the crux of our conversation tonight. If you have celiac disease or a wheat allergy, you need to follow a strict gluten-free diet. So including cross-contamination or cross-contact, it's very, very strict. With the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, the recommendations are unknown, which is super frustrating. So a part of me wants to say, let's be as careful as possible because you'll probably feel significantly better by not accidentally contaminating yourself. But there's also sort of a lifestyle component of this. And if you're going to feel really restrictive and you know you don't want to start with an extreme, but start just seeing how you feel with a little bit of a watchful eye. And then if you're still not feeling well, really avoiding it, then that's also fine too. But there's just so you know, there's no actual hardcore recommendations when it comes to non-celiac gluten sensitivity. But if you have celiac disease or a wheat allergy, um, hyper alert, um, strict gluten-free diet. Okay. I don't see any questions. So we will keep going to making sure I'm not missing anything. Perfect. Okay. So Let's start with the kitchen. I always want to start with the kitchen because I feel like this is where we spend most of our time, right? Even though we probably don't want to, unless you like absolutely love cooking, but we do spend a majority of our time in the kitchen. So with celiac disease and a wheat allergy, and let's just say the non-celiac gluten sensitivities, where we have to be super careful in the kitchen is really making sure we're not getting cross contaminated or cross contact. I'm using those terms interchangeably. There's like this whole debate out there where you don't actually want to use the term cross contamination because cross contamination is very much associated with like foodborne illnesses, right? Where E. coli and salmonella, like that's cross contamination. And sometimes with that language, you almost get the impression that, oh, I'll just use bleach and just kill gluten. Um, it doesn't, it, you can't do that. So um, in this world, we do like to say cross contact, just because that is a little bit of a non-bacterial uh, way of, of getting gluten to basically. So we really want to watch cross contact in the kitchen. So if you have been eating gluten in your kitchen before, um, you're going to have to do a big overhaul. So I'm sure you've heard um, you're going to need a new toaster. Um, anything made out of plastic or wood that has touched gluten. So for example, like this lovely picture, if you can see like the pasta in these like little plastic containers, you plastic degrades. So you definitely want to get new plastic containers, new Tupperware containers. If you're going to work or school, you want to make sure that those are fresh. Um, any pots and pans that have been scratched. So like your favorite frying pan that you've probably used for years is just scratched and the reason why we have to be so careful is because if you were to think of like how much gluten would cause an actual reaction um it's if you can you imagine like a little smarty or an m m it's like 1 20th of that so a tiny 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 little amount of gluten can do that much damage to your small intestine especially while you're trying to heal your gut in the very critical beginning stage of celiac disease. Um, when you've been stabilized on the gluten-free diet for decades, a little particle might not cause as much of a symptomatic response if you were just still trying to heal. Um, so it's really important in the early stages to, to really give everything a, a swipe clean. So things like cutting boards, unfortunately, when you're traveling and you're staying at someone else's place, one way to kind of get around that is just wax paper. So if you wanted to like put some wax paper on a cutting board and 
use that, that would be totally fine too. So if you didn't want to spend money on your cutting board, definitely add like a protective layer. Things like cloths and dishcloths, um, be super careful about too, because somebody who maybe is making themselves a sandwich might just use that cloth and wipe the counter and then you go grab it and you wipe the cutting board that's specifically for you. So the kitchen really needs this like huge, big overhaul. Um, things like colanders too. So those little holes in the colanders, which are a pain and to clean <laughs> those, just get a new one, just especially if it's plastic too. So let me just make sure I haven't missed anything. Do, 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 do. Beautiful. Um, and I'm sure you already know this too. So make sure the condiments, um, kind of like the toaster, there's ones that are, are a little bit more obvious. So if you are sharing a kitchen with somebody who's still eating gluten, you do want to make sure you have your own condiments. So like margarine, um, mayo, if you're doing any sort of peanut butter, because what happens is we double dip, right? So we take too much and then we put the knife back in after we've like wiped our bread. So we really want to make sure that like, your hummus, same thing with like crackers, if we're double dipping, um, you really want your own condiments. It's probably easier just for the whole family to go gluten-free, just because exactly what I'm saying, like you don't want to have two margarines or two peanut butters, but um, if that's hard too, then I totally get it. And if you have the space in your kitchen for like a separate section of it to be dedicated gluten-free, do that. My kitchen's definitely not big enough to do that. So I totally understand that that might not be an option for a lot of people. So um, yeah, so that's the kitchen. So really like as a newly diagnosed person, um, really make sure you're not getting any cross-contamination or cross-contact in your kitchen. Is there any questions out there before I move on to grocery shopping? Okay. It doesn't look like it, so I'm just going to keep going. So let's talk about the grocery store. So the there is some contamination <laughs> that goes on in the grocery store. So I kind of see it in like three places. So one, definitely the bulk food section. So with somebody who's really watching um, for the celiac disease or the wheat allergy, Probably not so much with the uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but definitely for the, the first two, um, you really want to watch the bulk food sections. And the reason why is because kind of that cross contact again with that scooper. So somebody could be, you know, using that scooper and scooping barley into a bag and then they put the scooper back in the quinoa container and then that would just immediately cause a cross contact or cross contamination. Um, also, sometimes when they are putting the grains or the flours into these big containers, they're sometimes doing that in a very closed room. Um, and then obviously there's going to be cross-contamination and cross-contact in that room as they're doing that. Um, so yeah, so if you're going to be doing the bulk food, please don't do that if you have celiac disease or a wheat allergy. And there is a question. Um, let me just, this is my multi-task skills. Um, I'll read the question out loud just so everyone knows what I'm reading. So uh, I'm so someone is sensitive and she's been eating gluten-free for about six years and feels better. Also, if she eats soy or yeast extract, I have a terrible stomach ache. Yeah, um, super sensitive. Um, soy, so yeast, I'm not surprised to hear that. Soy, I'm surprised to hear that. Soy is not necessarily a high risk and we'll talk about this in a second, a high-risk food for cross-contamination. But honestly, um, it's people, I think, have a whole degree of sensitivity. So if you feel sensitive with those two foods, then trust yourself. Um, and I know like even one of my clients just a couple of months ago, we were talking and she was getting gluten and we could not figure out where it was coming from. And it was simple as her dog, her dog food. So it's not that she was eating her dog food, but just that the fact that this, these wheat biscuits 
burn her house and she's getting cross contaminated every day. So I think really, I think that's great that you're paying attention and you've noticed those two foods and you're sensitive. So 100%, um, yeah, keep those out of your diet. And reading labels. Yes, we're going to talk about reading labels, which is a huge topic. So thank you. Yes. Um, and another question, would a dishwasher clean gluten? Yeah, I'm totally, so yeah, you don't need to do anything extreme. Um, maybe if you're really nervous, give the dishes a rinse before you put them in the dishwasher and then put them in the dishwasher for a good clean. But yeah, no, dishwasher will totally do the trick. So um, yes, good question. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Amazing. So, okay, so watch the bulk food sections in the grocery stores. Um, you also want to watch the deli. So there's a couple of places in the deli that you need to be super careful of. Um, the meat cutter is one of them. So sometimes the deli meats, either the spices or how they've been prepped, um, actually has gluten on it. So if somebody's cutting your meat and they've just cut some meat that had gluten, that would be a place for cross contact. You can definitely ask the deli staff to give that meat cutter a quick wipe before they cut your meat. Um, the other place in the deli is the soups. So I know like the delicious homemade soups um, that are in those huge kind of like warming containers. What deli staff do is they have to check the temperatures to make sure it's food safe. And sometimes let's say you have like a gluten-free chili next to a chicken noodle soup and they're just using the same thermometer in both soups that would be enough to cross contact your gluten-free soup so just be really careful of, of that um okay so label reading as promised now this is going to get a little bit confusing so please bear with me and i'm going to make sure i talk slowly and leave lots of room for questions because i know this is um this is frustrating so just so you know, before we even get into the label reading, so in Canada, we have 11 priority allergens. So those are the things like soy, um, mustard, sulfites, wheat, what else is there? Peanuts. So there's 11 of them. Um, so we have to, in Canada, declare if any of these top 11 allergens are found in foods. So they either have to declare it by having in clear language it in the ingredient list or in bold writing says contains. I have a couple examples and I feel like, I wonder if I should show you. I'm just gonna move this over and hopefully this works. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. Um, if not, I'll just be talking to myself. Okay, so as you can see, flat, bold, no questions asked, contains milk contains soy, milk, sesame seeds, contains soy, sesame. So very clear, no questions. Um, and then with clear writing, it will look like this. So it will say brackets wheat. So they have to declare. So that is a huge burden off of us because it's always going to be very, very obvious if a product has one of the top 11 allergens, which includes wheat. So where it gets really complicated is these other sort of labels, right? So you're going to see a lot of companies have gluten-free tags or claims on them. There is the Celiac Association one, which is very, very trustworthy. But a lot of companies don't even do that. And they just sort of have like in bold writing, gluten-free or somewhere on the label, gluten-free. Or it could be that even like black and white GF label. Um, but that's a claim and that's a label on the product, which is fine. But where we run into problems is these like precautionary statements. So those usually fall below, like, you have the ingredient list and then you have the contains and then you have these like precautionary statements. And these precautionary statements are things like may contain wheat or made in a facility that also processes wheat or made on shared equipment that used wheat. So the frustrating part is that these precautionary statements are voluntary. So they have to be truthful. But what I'm noticing is more and more companies are just putting this label on just to cover themselves in case somebody gets gluten and, and they're not sure if it came from their product. So they're just kind of covering their butts. So it's not the most helpful label. Um, and there's a question. What about make and takes? Oh, yes. Okay. So I just, yeah, I think probably the, 
I think I answered that while you were probably typing that. So yeah, just to confirm. So contains, very obvious, the may contains is a precautionary voluntary statement. So we're going to go through some examples just to make sure that this is super clear. Um, don't forget that people with celiac disease or a wheat allergy are going to be on these like hyper alert things. The non-celiac gluten sensitivity, um, it's totally, it's totally your call. I would probably follow the labels as well. So please bear with me. This is going to get ugly, but I'm going to make sure we get all this together. So imagine a product has that no, there's no gluten-free claim. So there's no big celiac association label on it. There is nothing on the product that says it's gluten-free and there's no gluten containing ingredients. So to remember the gluten containing ingredient ingredients, it's, you can think of brow, like B-R-O-W. So that stands for barley, rye, oats, and wheat. So there's only four ingredients you're looking for. So this product, there's no gluten-free claim, which is fine because there's no gluten-containing ingredients. So check, you're totally allowed to eat that, no questions asked. The next product, so it doesn't have this gluten-free claim and it has that contained statement, right? This is an obvious one because we know if it has that contained statement, then it's part of the top 11 allergies and they've had to declare that there's wheat in this product. So that is not safe for you. The next, the next example is there's no gluten-free claim. There's no gluten-containing ingredients. So there's no brow. So no barley, no rye, no oats, or no wheat. But it has this may contain wheat claim. So that's that precautionary statement where it could say may contain wheat or made in a facility that also processes wheat or made on shared equipment that's not going to be safe for you. Um, you'll see though, that will be safe for you if there was a gluten-free claim. So a really good example of this, and this is a recent change that they made about a year ago. So I remember, um, I'm not sure if I said this in my introduction, but I used to actually work at Choices as one of the um, in-store dietitians. And I remember the company Amy's, who I love to pieces, like this is what they did. They would have huge gluten-free claims on their burritos, but then they would have this like may contain wheat statement underneath the ingredient list. So I would always say to people, can't do this. It's not safe. Um, but we've just discovered it's totally safe for somebody with celiac disease. It's not safe for somebody with a wheat allergy. So that's where we kind of get to the next one. So um, it's a gluten, there's a gluten-free claim and there's that may contain wheat statement. It's fine for someone with celiac, not for wheat, because the gluten-free claim trumps the may contain. And the reason why I say this, and I hope you're still with me, is that it has to be less than 20 parts per million to be safe for somebody with celiac disease. Um, but for somebody with a wheat allergy, like five parts per million could cause an anaphylactic shock. Um, so that is why it's really strict. It's actually more strict for a weed allergy compared to celiac disease. And then the last example is a gluten-free product made in a bakery that also produces gluten-containing products. So um, how are you guys feeling? So that is, I know a mouthful. I have a couple more slides when we get a little bit more complicated into the high-risk foods. Um, so I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with this before I move on to the like high risk food items for someone following a gluten-free diet. So I'm just gonna wait for a second to make sure we're, we're okay. We're okay. I think there's a slight delay. Thank you for letting me know. So I'm just gonna wait. Cause sometimes it might even be while well, you put your thoughts together. And if you want me to repeat anything, I'm more than happy to repeat. I'm just gonna wait a second.
Okay, I'm just going to keep talking, um, but I will definitely stop. Oh, yes. Okay. I'll read the question out loud. Um, say the barley thing again. So going back to the slide, um, where somebody who's avoiding gluten, there are four foods that contain gluten in our in our grocery stores or kind of in our world. And the acronym is BROW. Um, if that's helpful. It's probably not helpful at all, but it's brow. So B for barley, R for rye, O for oats. Um, we can talk about oats in a second, but uh, regular oats and W for wheat. So those are the four ingredients or four foods that contain gluten. Okay. That's the barley thing. So that's why like when we're looking at labels, um, as long as there's no gluten containing ingredient, which is the brow, um, and there's no gluten free claim, that's why it's safe for you, if that makes sense. And what is the gluten free certification process? Ooh, you know what? Um, with the Celiac Association, I'm going to show you theirs. Let me just see if I can move my stuff over and share my screen with you, because I know I have it here. Bear with me, and I'm going to show you. Oh, where did I put it? Okay. Perfect. So I'm assuming you can still see my screen. So this was the question is like, what is the gluten-free uh, certification process? So this is the, probably the safest one out there. And this is the Canadian Celiac Association. So it's the gluten-free certification program. So this is also a voluntary program. Um, so it gives the, it goes through HACCP. I forget, I totally learned all this. HACCP is this like risk assessment protocol um, where they step-by-step -step go through, like if this happens, then we'll do this. And if this happens, then we'll go through this. So there's this huge basically plan that they have in place to prevent any gluten contamination. Um, and it costs money. So people do want to do this because it's, it's a safe, Basically, no questions asked. You pick up this product and you can trust that it's there. So it costs about four, like five hundred bucks um, for even the application fee. A lot of companies do do this and then they pull off because they're like, okay, um, I understand the the HACCP plan. I'm going to be doing it, and now I'm going to stick my own gluten free claim on it without paying the five hundred bucks a year for the for the actual stamp. So, um, oh, they can't see my screen. Okay. Can you, I wish I could show you this slide, but that's okay. So I kind of talked you through the whole slide. Um, I wish I could show you the actual stamp. It's not in my slides, but um, maybe what I'll do is send me an email and I can send you this slide if you want, but I'll come back to my other slides. Okay. Can you just double check, are you guys all seeing, because now that I'm, I'm paranoid that you can't see, um, could you just let me know if you can see my slide? It's called, I'm on label reading one. Is that what you've been following along with me? Okay, you can just see the table. Yeah, okay. Okay, sorry guys, I was hoping to show you um, some other things, but for some other reason, I can't figure that piece out. Maybe, let me just try one thing. Yeah. Okay. What I'll do at the very end, I'll stop sharing my screen and then I will restart sharing it again um, to show you the, the Celiac Association stamp. Okay. Now I'm going to read the question out loud. Are products that don't claim any wheat okay for celiac? Example, Campbell's chicken broth doesn't say contain or may contain. It's cheaper versus Imagine Broth that claim gluten-free marks are the great question. So kind of like going through the algorithm. Um, so what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that there's no gluten containing ingredients in that product. So again, is there, do you see any barley? Do you see any rye? Do you see any oats? Do you see any wheat? I don't think so. I think it's totally fine. Um, and then make it just double check. Is there a contained statement? So in bold, 
does it say contains wheat? If it doesn't, um, and there's no gluten-free claim, I think you're totally fine with Campbell's chicken broth. Um, so I hope, yeah, 100%, you don't have to do the more expensive Imagine broth. Okay, sorry guys that you couldn't see my, my celiac thing. I'll try to troubleshoot that. Okay, so label reading number two. Um, this is where we get a little bit more complicated. So what's happening with label reading here is that these are the high risk foods. So when we're talking about the gluten containing ingredients, those are just the four gluten, where gluten kind of hides. So, but there is risk in foods that actually aren't even in that criteria. So for example, gluten-free flours and starches, um, pulses such as lentils, in particular lentils, it's it's really sad because I, somewhere, whether it's the harvesting, whether it's the distribution, whether it's the packaging, like most of the time, um, gluten-free flours and pulses and lentils, if you actually like, you know, physically look at the lentils, you'll see a big thing of barley in there. Um, I did have a picture and I was going to show you, but I, I don't want to fight with my screen. So they're the high risk foods we need to be really careful of. So and oats are another one as well as flax seeds and hemp seeds. So to make things a little bit simpler, this is how we kind of think about them is all the high risk foods must, must, must always have a gluten free claim or tag on it. So when you're buying, let's say, almond flour, or let's say potato starch, then typically grab like Bob's Red Mill because he's always um, using a gluten-free claim or tag on his products. Um, rice, you don't have to worry about it. Rice is not kind of grown in the same fields as other wheat products like barley. So you are totally fine not worrying about a gluten-free label on rice, um, but definitely with the other ones. So just to kind of go through this really quickly, so um, grains and flours that don't have a gluten-free label, right? So if you're just buying, again, you know, cornstarch or almond flour or chickpea flour, you always want to make sure these gluten-free alternative flours has a gluten-free tag or label stuck to it. Um, again, the rice, don't worry about the rice. Um, the, if there's a gluten-free label, but basically what this is saying is that, yeah, totally fine. Oats are one that you do need to be careful of too. You always want to make sure the oats are gluten free. And what's really sad right now is last year the harvesting of oats um, was terrible. I think it was the floods, or sorry, not the floods, the drought. Um, so a lot the the amount of oats that are available that are gluten free are just the stock is just not there. So companies such as Earth Own, um, who make amazing oat milk, had to pull all their gluten free claims off their oat milk. So that would have been safe for somebody with celiac disease or a wheat allergy, but um, it's not going to be pretty soon. So if that does sound like you, um, stock up because Earth's Own is still getting rid of what they have in stock, but they are definitely not using gluten-free oats right now. So, um, okay, I'm just going to recap really quick to make sure that you guys follow that because I get the label reading gets really confusing really quickly. So what you want to do is follow the labels, make sure that there's no gluten containing ingredients there, make sure that there's no big bold contain statement, and then you're good to go except for the high risk foods. And the high risk foods are the gluten-free flours and starches and lentils and oats, basically. Okay, make sure there, feel free to dump, dump any questions in the chat box. This is basically just kind of going over, like it's the second half of the, the chart. So um, I'll just leave it there for a second. And then we're gonna move on to nutrients if nobody has any questions. But I will stop and make sure that you guys are good. Okay. 
So what I really want to say over here is when you do follow a gluten-free diet, there is some nutrients you're naturally going to be missing because we tend to fortify a lot of our, our grains and our oats and our flours with things like folate and iron as well. So yes, unfortunately, because sometimes of the damage done to the small intestine, you're already not actually absorbing nutrients properly. And then add on top of this, you know, eating more rice flour and eating more rice pasta that just hasn't been fortified with folate or iron. So really be on the high alert for folate and for iron, um, calcium. In a gluten-free diet, we tend to be lacking calcium only because if you have any issues or damage done to your intestine, um, you're really going to struggle absorbing calcium. And that's why people have lactose intolerance um, with gluten-free lifestyle as well. Typically, when you kind of stabilize on the gluten-free diet, you'll probably be able to tolerate dairy again, but at least in the very beginning, um, those two things go hand in hand. So we tend to be lacking calcium as well. Um, fiber is a big one. So really flag fiber, um, just because as you can imagine, um, rice, white rice, white pasta, rice crackers, rice cakes, there's not a lot of fiber in these products. So somebody who's following a gluten-free diet tends to be really missing out on the, on the fiber. So, you know, whenever you can, um, try to get more fiber into your diet. Um, really easy ways would be, you know, making sure they're gluten-free, but doing more flax seeds and more hemp hearts or more chia seeds, um, eating lots of like berries, um, oranges are a great source of fiber or eggplant. So, or the like slow burning grains like buckwheat or quinoa. So really like, don't forget about the fiber. It's really easy to kind of get into this like rice world, but rice doesn't have a lot of fiber. Ooh, do baking powder and baking soda have to have the claim? No, you are totally fine with the baking powder and, and the baking soda. It's the starch. So if you're going to buy cornstarch, though, um, make sure cornstarch has a gluten-free claim. Great question. Thank you. Okay, so does that all make sense from a nutrients to be aware of? Um, perfect. And then also just as a side note, too, um, without getting too complicated on you guys, but it's also really important because inflammation, anytime we have sort of GI issues, whether it's actual structural damage or whether it's, you know, gas or bloating or acid reflux, like we're all a little bit inflamed. So um, making sure like you do watch your inflammatory foods and really increasing your anti-inflammatory foods is super important. So just as a general rule of thumb, really watch um, like try to up the omega-3. So omega-3s are the king of anti-inflammation. So if you wanted to do more like salmon or more gluten-free hemp hearts or um, flax seeds or walnuts, those are all really great. Thing on nuts too, before I forget, nuts are totally fine. Um, they're not a high-risk food. They get totally processed somewhere differently. So you don't have to worry about a gluten-free claim on nuts. Okay. And then the last thing I want to talk to you guys about was leaky gut, because I don't know if it's just the, the internet or if it's, I don't know how this rumor got passed along, but basically we kind of put gluten as the evil explanation of leaky gut. So a lot of people don't do gluten because, because they think it causes leaky gut. So leaky gut is basically your, it's also called intestinal permeability. So your intestinal cells are usually pretty tight, but because of inflammation, um, basically the tight junctions get a little bit separated and food sneaks out way sooner than it should, causing sort of like a systemic reaction in the body. So just so you know, gluten doesn't actually cause that, that intestinal permeability. It doesn't actually cause the tight junctions to kind of separate. Um, Having celiac disease will cause leaky gut, though. So because gluten, it's it's something called zonulin, which is more and more research is coming out, but zonulin can literally like unzip this. So the relationship is there, but it's not the way we used to think. So definitely 
um, celiac disease, any sort of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or colitis. Stress causes inflammation, which will cause leaky gut. Certain medications, um, gut dysbiosis will cause leaky gut. So please know it's a bigger thing and, and gluten is not the sole culprit of, of leaky gut. Okay. So that is everything. Um, I'm going to leave lots of room for questions now, just because I know I went through that really quickly and I want to make sure that you guys are totally okay. and You got your questions answered. So, um, and if you want a copy of my slides, then please send me an email. It's just Jess at foodyourself.com. Um, or if you want a copy of the, let's go back to it, of the diagnosis process of celiac disease, let me know too, and I'm more than happy to send that to you. Um, yeah, but please be in contact and let me know if you need anything. Um, and I'm just going to stay here for a little bit and make sure all your questions are answered. But Thank you so much for coming tonight. I really do appreciate it. And um, yeah, and thank you for asking questions because it's great when there's um, questions. Yeah, thanks guys. And if we have a second, I'm going to try to show you that gluten-free claim. So let's see if I can do this. There it is. Okay. Um, that is the gluten-free certification program. That's the stamp that I was talking to you about that's coming out from the Canadian Celiac Association. So I'll just leave that slide up so that you can see. And sorry that I was talking to myself before. Oh, my contact information. Okay, so it is on the other slide. Um, okay, so what I'll do is I will go back to the other slide or what I'm gonna do, I wonder what would be easiest. Okay, I'm gonna have to stop this and give you my contact information, but I'll just read my contact information out and I'll leave the slide for two more seconds. It's Jess, so J-E-S-S -S at Food Yourself, so F-O-O-D-Y-O-U-R-S-E-L-F dot com. Um, okay, and I'm gonna stop sharing this and go back to my other slide so you can actually see my contact information. Okay. So there it is. My website's foodyourself.com and there's my email address um, and then my other stuff. And there was a question. I'll read it out loud. Is intestinal damage from celiac reversed completely with a gluten-free diet? Yes. So this is where it's very individual. So when you first get diagnosed with celiac disease, they're going to hopefully have done a TTG, which is your antibody test. Um, typically, that number is gonna be so high, they don't even measure it anymore. So it's gonna be above 250. So the goal is to get below 12. So in that process to go from above 250 to less than 12, I've had a client um, within like six months get her number below 12, but I've had other clients it takes like two years. So it really depends on how long you've been undiagnosed for um, in order to bring down that TTG number. The reason why 12 is the important number is because if your TTG is high, higher than 12, then you're at an increased risk of all those things that we talked about at the very beginning. So increased risk for um, malabsorption of iron and calcium and therefore osteopenia, um, small intestinal cancers, other autoimmune diseases. So if you don't get that number less than 12, those are the high risk things that are going to hopefully not happen, but are potentially um, going to happen. So it's really important to follow a strict gluten-free diet. Once your number is less than 12, then you've totally stabilized on the gluten-free diet and your intestines are healed and the damage is reversed. 
So, and that's why we were talking about how um, you might not be able to do lactose right now, but then once you've healed, you can do lactose again. So yes, to answer your question, um, intestinal damage from celiac is completely reversible. You'll always have celiac disease, but um, we can reverse the damage. Okay, some restaurants offer gluten-free options, but it's the same kitchen. How can that be safe? Yeah, so this is where you have to kind of be this irritating consumer and really ask questions. So sometimes really great restaurants, and I know a handful of them in Vancouver, have like a separate fryer for their French fries, or they take really great care and they use a totally separate section in the kitchen for their gluten-free products. Um, yes, there's some really great restaurants um, off the top of my head. The Nubas is very, very accommodating. I know the Celiac Association goes to Nubas all the time. Um, oh my God, now I'm pulling a blank. Um, I email me and I can always send you the list. Um, but there's, yes, there's definitely some really great safe restaurants who know what to do when it comes to celiac disease. Um, how does the body react to a gluten-free diet? So are you thinking like, um, how does the body react to a gluten-free diet? So I would say, okay, so let's say just average Joe is not doing gluten anymore. Um, the body is totally fine without gluten. Like gluten is not needed, um, but it's not harmful either for the average Joe. So gluten is just a protein that makes things really stretchy. So you don't technically need it, but the problem is, is it's really, the food that it's found in is like these higher fiber foods. So that's why you have to be really careful when you do follow a gluten-free diet that you are, you know, not missing fiber, you're not following a high sugar diet because a lot of the gluten-free products tend to be, they could, they could be junky, right? So we got to make sure that we're, we're hitting all the nutrients we need while following gluten-free diet, but your body can totally handle and react to a gluten-free diet um, without any huge ramifications. I think that's your question, but if I didn't answer that correctly, let me know. Yes, thank you. It's icky. I, I knew there was a Japanese. Oh, sorry, I'll read the question. Um, so or the, the comment, not the question. Um, so a few suggestions of the keg and icky, the Japanese restaurant, are good gluten-free options. Um, I don't know about the keg, but I know icky, the Canadian Celiac Association goes to Icky's all the time. They're in downtown Vancouver. Um, but yeah, I have a, I don't know, I'm I'm totally pulling a blank. I have a list of the restaurants the CCA goes to, and I'm now just pulling a blank. Um, on the restaurant question, is there an association that lists restaurants who follow gluten-free guidelines? Yeah, I'm not a BC resident. So the Celiac Association was partnering up with this app called Honeycomb. So Honeycomb was trying to do this, but I think the problem is, is there is such high turnover in restaurants that they we're finding it hard to find a consistent answer. So you can go in and you can, you know, one day be totally fine. And then the next day it's different staff. She has no idea what celiac disease is. I just, I, there's so many times where I've gone to restaurants with like my mom, for example, and uh, the staff are like, Oh, do you have like your EpiPen? And my mom's like, Oh, it's, it's not, it's, it's not like that. It's, it's an actual like autoimmune disease. So I think that's the problem. And that's why nobody wants to commit to saying yes to certain restaurants and not because to train the staff is impossible but um, honeycomb was trying to do it and honeycomb is i believe it's, it's an app so it's a national thing not just a bc thing but honestly um i have a list from that i've been collecting to of gluten-free restaurants here that i'm more than happy to share if you're not in bc it's just going to be like literally trial and error where you're going to have to call the restaurants, speak to them, educate, and just be really irritating. Sorry, that was the, the best answer I can give with the restaurants. Ooh, are gluten-free scanning apps accurate for ingredients? Um, 
there's one that the Canadian Celiac Association uses, but it's more of a pocket dictionary than it is the scanning. Um, honestly, I'm a little bit skeptical of them. Um, just because like oats are a big thing. So like you would be amazed at how much mislabeling there is when it comes to oats. So, so many products put a gluten-free label on their, you know, their, their oats, their oat milk, their oat yogurts. Like there's the oat industry is huge right now. It's a very trendy um, industry. And unless the oats are gluten-free using this um, purity protocol, these products aren't safe. So there's a lot of mislabeling. Um, the Celiac Association is constantly fighting with Health Canada just to fix this. But um, I'm a little bit skeptical of the apps. Um, I know if there was one that worked, I feel like we would know it and we would we would be <sighs> trying to push it on people because it would make life so simple. But um, I'm not comfortable with any of the scanning apps right now. If we're still struggling with like labeling products on the shelf. Sorry. Uh, is there a fully gluten-free grocery store? Um, no, but that would make life so simple um, if we could just go to one place and just feel super confident um, that all the foods there would be gluten-free. Um, honestly, I'm not just saying this because this is through choices, but um, all the little, excuse me, I'm burping up my tea. Um, all the like, more smaller stores have amazing options for gluten-free stuff. So like Choices is great or Nestor's is great. Um, the, and the good prices too, like compared to um, other stores who sell a little bit of everything. But no, I, there's no fully gluten-free grocery store, unfortunately. But I love that idea. And while you guys are doing it, I'll try to find that restaurant list that I have. Okay. So this is in, um, I've been kind of keeping this list. So this is more on the island. Um, let's see if there's anything here. Where's my, there's my Vancouver list. 
Okay. So, okay, here's my little um, list of safe gluten-free restaurants that we've been to and that we've eaten at and the staff are incredible. So Nuba, Cactus Club, Joey's Meat, Irish Heather, Red Robin, um, this poutine place on Davy. I don't, I, that, that was my description. Um, Miku, so M I K U, Bin for Burger, Earl's, Milestones, The Wallflower Pub, and the Gluten Free Epicurean Bakery. Um, I'll read those one more time just because I read those really quickly. So, Nuba, Cactus Club, Joey's, Meat, and Meat spelled like um, it's the vegan. Um, restaurant, not like as in meat, as in M-E-A-T. Um, Irish Heather, they have gluten-free fish and chips. That was the note I made. So obviously we were on the hunt for gluten-free fish and chips. Um, Red Robins, Miku, so M-I-K-U, Bin for Burger, Earl's, Milestones, the Wallflower Pub, and the Gluten-Free Epicurean Bur uh, Bakery. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that helps. Um, and someone said, I love choices. I follow their flyer weekly and buy what is on sale gluten-free. Yeah, I know, honestly, um, thank you. I know I'm biased too, but honestly, it's, um, choices has good prices for alternative stuff. So if you're ever looking for, you know, dairy alternatives or gluten-free alternatives, or if you were looking for like peanut-free stuff, like honestly, choices has a great price. Um, do you think fast food places might be safe if they say gluten-free? Um, I would honestly, so like that list I just read, um, what I usually do is I do ask additional questions. So um, even if it says gluten-free, I'm just like, do you understand what that means? Like, and I'll, if it's fast food, I'll say, do you have a separate fryer for your French fries? And a really good example of why you want to do this is white spot. It's really interesting. What I've learned is that some white spots are franchised and some are individually owned. So, and they have very different protocols. So I forget which one is better for celiacs and which one is not as safe, but you want to ask these questions. So always say, you know, like, is this, do you understand what celiac disease is? And are you using a separate fryer? And what is your, what is your protocol for accommodating gluten-free meal? Um, okay, getting to diagnose celiac is not, is, is not easy. Is it not in regular checkup? Do you think this will be become part of a regular blood work when you visit the doctor? That's a really great question. So in Scandinavia, this this is it. Like babies are born and are tested um, for their TTG. Uh, some insider information. Um, so I was talking to a brand new gastroenterologist. And in order to pass and become a gastroenterologist, they have to do this like 400 multiple choice questionnaire. I might be making up how much that is. And, and I think he said to me, there was like two questions on celiac disease. So in like an, a six hour long exam, they only get asked two questions about celiac disease. So it's very, so considering it's been around for decades, um, doctors are just not educated. So I hope like one day um, doctors understand because like my mom, for example, was asymptomatic. So we had no idea she had celiac disease or even how long she would have had celiac disease. But um, it's really easy. Like there's so many symptoms of celiac disease, like just random iron deficiency anemia. And there could be so many reasons why you have that. So doctors just don't like celiac disease. But um, our hope obviously with advocacy is that more and more doctors become aware and will start actually recognizing that this is a huge part of our population. Um, and I hope, I hope this becomes a routine screening because it's just a simple blood test at this point. So yeah, I hope, I hope that was a very long answer to your, to your, your question, but you do need to advocate for yourself. Like if you do want the um, TTG and sometimes doctors are like, why are you asking for this? You're, asymptomatic um feel free to use my name you can be like i'm working with a dietitian and she's asking that i get tested um so yeah feel free to use my name by all means i'm gonna make sure i didn't miss okay i haven't missed anything okay
thanks for all your questions, guys. Okay, it sounds like there's just a bunch of thank yous, which so thank you for coming tonight and asking questions and being engaged. That really means a lot. Um, please be in contact. I'm definitely around. Um, again, hopefully you can see this screen, but my email is there and like my website if you want to get a hold of me too. Um, yeah, thank you guys. I really do appreciate it. You are, it's after eight. You're more than welcome to go and have dinner. Hopefully, we've already eaten. Um, but if you haven't, please go and have dinner <laughs> and happy almost Friday. Have an amazing rest of your week and have an amazing weekend. And um, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Jess. That was amazing. Good. All right. Have a nice night, everyone.